So you're about to listen to an episode or perhaps watch it if you're on YouTube where I chat with Patrick Keene of the Action Network about trends in sports betting. The thing is, we recorded this in early March. COVID-19 was just becoming a thing. Sports hadn't been canceled yet, but shortly thereafter, sports were indeed canceled and uncertainty reigned. So this episode sat on the sidelines for a while. Fast forward a few months, some sports are starting to come back, and all the while, states have continued to legalize sports betting. So we decided to go ahead and release this episode now, and even though there are some dated references, the overall long-term trend really hasn't changed. States are legalizing sports betting, sports leagues are getting involved, and technology is helping to usher in a new era of gaming. So with all that in mind, I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to Trends with Benefits, a podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, investing, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. Hi, I'm Ed Lopez, and this is Trends with Benefits. My guest today is Patrick Keene, CEO of the Action Network, a sports betting data and information company. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So tell me about Action Network. What does it mean, sports betting data and information company? So the Action Network was started to inform and be a trusted advisor to sports bettors. As we've seen over the years, sports betting since the passing of PASPA in 2018 has become a much bigger opportunity for consumers and businesses alike. And we built a platform that is both a subscription platform where consumers pay to have access to our data information and tools. And we also have a business that drives revenue through an affiliate platform where we convert our customers to sports books. So as more states become legal, we're now full four mobile states in the U.S., New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and West Virginia. We think that'll double this year. And that really is the representative of the opportunity. So we really want to inform consumers on how to bet. Let's talk. go back a little bit and talk about the underlying background there. You mentioned PASPA, which is the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act. That's right. That was passed in 1992, recently uh, overturned in 2018. Is That's that correct. Right? Okay. New Jersey led that effort. Tell me about about what happened there. And is that the trend that we're, is that the basis of the business and what's really got you, got you guys going? It, it certainly is. The business was built in advance of PASPA being overturned. So there was all, there's always been an undercurrent of people betting on sports, be it legally, be it offshore, be it in lots of places. So there was always an opportunity to build an information platform that was going to super serve those users. But now that we've seen sports betting become legal almost two years now, it's provided a massive accelerant to our business. And the key is to have a federally mandated law doesn't mean it's state by state. So each state has to approve legislation to bring sports betting into their state walls. So New Jersey, as you mentioned, has been the most forward thinking and Pennsylvania soon followed suit. And we're hopefully to see this year Colorado and Virginia and Michigan. And those are going to be big markets as well as Tennessee. So our business grows with the acceptance and with more and more states coming online. But we had built this business even without PASPA being overturned. So that was a fortunate outcome that we had been betting on, if you will. And, and how are sports leagues taking advantage of sports betting? I mean, before that, the, that, that ruling was overturned, weren't some of the leagues suing the states for trying to open it up a little bit? I think some of the leagues felt that this was going to be a challenge and potentially a detriment to their success. We have seen unequivocally it to be the opposite. Fans that bet on sports are more engaged. They go to more games. They watch more games. They listen to more games. So it's a more avid fan. And I think that's obviously going to be very fortuitous for the leagues. We've seen all of them take different approaches to it, the most powerful of which is clearly the National Football League, which has been the most conservative, I would say, of all the leagues and rights holders with respect to sports betting. But they have certainly taken a more aggressive look at it with approving deals around daily fantasy and looking at operator opportunities. But we've recently announced a deal with the PGA Tour, which we're excited about. I would say the PGA Tour, the NBA are probably the most forward thinking of the leagues or rights holders. But I would say if you're any league, if you're any media company, rights holder, team, anyone in the world of sports, if you're not taking a thoughtful and aggressive approach to the opportunity in sports betting, you're just really missing a multi-billion dollar opportunity. 
and how do the leagues participate in that? Is it is it licensing? Is that how they're is that is that their form of participation in this arena? Well, it's in a few ways. Some is their licensing data. So they license data to people like Sports Radar and, and Genius and other companies. So that gives all of the sports book operators, media companies like ourselves, access to real time data, real time information that better informs odds. So they're able to see revenue through licensing of data and information. But then again, they're going to see if you look at the, the typical leagues and the typical revenue from sports, you really have sort of four classes of revenue that they typically see. You have uh, advertising, you have gate revenue, you have merchandise revenue, and then you have rights. And I would say the three that aren't rights are kind of growing with GDP a couple points a year. But we think that the the rights deals that they're going to sign could be going up in the double digit percentages. So we really think that this is going to drive a boon for the leagues because they're just going to see bigger rights deals because sports betting is going to be a massive accelerant to their businesses. Are there companies, I mean, you're an investor yourself in, in the markets. Are there public companies that benefit directly from from this change and this trend? Well, we're, we're starting to see more public analogs, and a lot of them aren't necessarily in the U.S. I mean, the Diamond Eagle uh, special purpose access investment vehicle that was put together that includes now DraftKings is an interesting opportunity to have an analog to bet in the sports category. You have Flutter P- Paddy Power, which is another opportunity, which is in Europe that's an opportunity to invest. But we're starting to see more public investors even look at our business. Um, we're certainly a, a, a private company. And we think that there's just going to be a bigger opportunity. All the things that I said, there's there's different metrics that would presume to be the size of the category. We think it's a couple hundred million do- billion dollars. And that is a opportunity and a large pie for all of the different rights holders, stakeholders, public investors, private investors, private equity. All of them are taking a look at the category and they either knock on our doors or are going to knock on the doors of other companies. And the states benefit from tax revenue, or will they get involved in sports betting themselves? Right now, it's purely tax revenue, and they all have different parameters of what that tax revenue is. If you look at Pennsylvania, it's as high as 34%. New Jersey is a little bit less, is is much less than that, rather, I should say. Um, We're starting to see more and more states evaluate the opportunity from a tax basis. And the numbers are quite large. If you look at New Jersey, New Jersey's handle, that is the the number of dollars bet in state, is already larger than Nevada. And that that just tells you how big these markets are, well north of $500 billion last year. So these are huge markets, big opportunities. And I would think if you're a state and you're going to turn a blind eye to that revenue, it's probably not the most fiscally responsible for those states. On the flip side of who wins in this arrangement, who, what about who loses? Do the casinos lose because they lose their dominance over gambling and perhaps sports books? Potentially, but I think the smart casinos are playing in the category as well. I mean, MGM is one of our biggest partners. They're a, they're a well-known brand, obviously, in Nevada and Vegas and more around table games. But for them to build a brand in sports betting, I think, is, is very wise of them. So they're getting in the category. But absolutely, if you are a casino, I think you're going to be concerned because – the overwhelming majority of sports betting that's going to happen in this country is going to be mobile. So New Jersey, 87% of handle was mobile. Uh, We think that is going to be the norm, not the exception. So if you are a casino operator that's trying to get people in your door and to stay in your doors to bet and to play table games and things like that, the convenience of a computer in your pocket and checking odds and checking data and looking at information and using an app like the Action Network to inform what you do, that's the absolute future for sports betting. So it's much is happening mobile. on mobile these days. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Gaming, betting. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you're, you're a sports fan yourself. Uh, do you do you gamble as well? Have you always been a, a gambler? I, I was not before I came to the company. I certainly, like most passionate sports, sports fans, myself included, did box pools for the Super Bowl, would do a March Madness pool, might do an individual peer-to-peer bet with friends about uh, my, my favorite teams in Philly versus their favorite teams in New York. That's something I've always done, but I hadn't been until I came to the company. And since I've just, I've seen personally that experience. I mean, we often do, I only bet legally. Uh, we only do those, we, we call them sort of our betting field trips where we go to New Jersey and right. go to a diner in Hoboken and sort of create what we think is, is Action Network East. Uh, and all the companies are there. Our partners are there. They're all in Jersey City or Hoboken from MGM and FanDuel and DraftKings and PointsBet. So 
it's sort of affectionately and interestingly been called Vegas East now. Yeah. Um, but but I uh, I bet modestly and again only legally. So I, I don't do a lot myself. So I'm curious. It, so people will will cross the river, go to Jersey to bet. They can use their phone there. If they have the app on their phone in New York. Can they still bet or do they, do they get an alert that says you can't? Yeah, no, you yeah. cannot bet in New York. New, all the states where online betting is legal are geofenced. So it, you have right. to enter the environment to be able to do it. I mentioned that 80 percent figure in New Jersey. And we've seen data that says upwards of 40 percent of the betting is happening within a two mile radius of the state border, which tells you that New York residents are a big part of the audience and the ecosystem for the success of New Jersey. So the PATH train or your local Uber or however you're going to get there, uh, New Jersey is pretty, pretty close. You can, yeah. you, you know, just get over the river. You can take a ferry. We do it often. And you, you anxiously cross the Holland Tunnel or cross the Lincoln Tunnel and get into those environments and open your phone and, and have that authentication happen. And they're going to know whether you're in New Jersey or not. So let's talk about Action Network. If somebody goes to the website, what do they see? What should they expect to, to, to get from your website? Action Network is a, is a number of things. One, we create excellent technology products and tools that allow you to track your picks. That's a big part of our platform. More than 50 million picks were tracked in our platform last year. That is a user who maybe places a bet at DraftKings or FanDuel or MGM or any of the other sites and then goes to the Action Network app and tracks that bet. They track the odds that they got the bet at. They track the units that they invested, the dollar amount. And then they're able to see their success in the platform, how they've done the last seven days, 30 days, 90 days, et cetera. And they can also see their success against individual sports. Am I a better NCAA football better or am I a better hockey better. So to be able to have that data is incredibly powerful. And there's also content. So we create 30, 40, 50 pieces of content a day, depending on the seasonality that we're in. We're about to have a massive one. We only have about 10 days to Selection Sunday for March Madness. And that's really our, our biggest time of year is when people are betting over that fortnight in the NCAA tournament. But it's content, it's data, it's tools, it's odds, it's line shopping. It's really, some people have referred to us as in many ways as the Expedia of sports betting, where you go and you see different odds, different offers, much like you'd see in an Expedia experience where you're looking at air travel or looking at hotels that you want to book. We have that um, component of our business, which is essentially the supply side. And then on the demand side, we have millions of users that are going coming through our platform that will see those odds as well. So we're in some ways a combination of TripAdvisor because we have the content and then Expedia because we have the the supply where you're able to actually purchase so against you can, where you want to go. You can book your betting experience through your yep. website. Yeah, we want to be a vertically integrated betting experience. We don't want to take the bet. We could see over over time that we would allow for deep linking to bet and a product that we're soon to launch that we're incredibly excited about, which is a patented ad set called BetSync, where you would place a bet at any number of sports books and automatically or automagically, as we say, mm -hmm. that bet will flow into our platform and you'll see it synced in our pick tracking platform. So a lot of bettors, you know, I think there's one of the important things about betting is a lot of these users don't have an affinity to brand. They have an affinity to price and to odds. So many bettors are going to have five, six. I mean, I look at my phone, I have seven different operators on my phone where I'm going to shop for whatever the best lines, odds and price are yeah. if I'm going to bet. Since you have an affiliate relationship with some of the sports books, do you get to see the size of the bets? And, and, and then... I'm assuming that's a, a revenue generator for for your business as well. Well, we, right? we'd see it more through the BetSync platform. Uh, and through that platform, we have no personally identifiable information, so it's not necessarily to a user. But one of the biggest differentiators for our company, and I talk about it often, and as a former Googler and worked there for many years, why are Google, Facebook, and Amazon increasingly successful? They have more first-party data on consumers than anyone through their platforms, their applications, and their tools. We have more first party better data. That's B E T T O R because we can see through our platform the number of bets people are selecting, the size of those bets, where they're placing them, the sports they invest in. And as I mentioned, that north of 50 million picks is an incredible differentiator for our platform. And I've heard you talk about uh, one of your missions is to convert the, the, the casual better. How, how do you go about converting somebody into becoming more of a a better or placing more bets? It's it's a challenge. There certainly are certain consumers that are daunted by the vernacular, the 
the it's a, it's an intimidating thing to do if you haven't done it before. Most people are typically used to just straight bets. Who's going to win the Eagles or the Sixers or the Eagles or the Giants? And in that scenario, it's sort of easy to figure out. But if you have money line, if you have odds, if you have what is a teaser, a parlay, it's just a confusing vernacular. And we also want to educate those people. So we want to be a comfortable place where someone who's only done the box pools or has only done NCAA tournament can come in and learn through the glossary of terms and FAQs how to bet and to find a, a comfortable place to be able to do that. But I think it, it is a challenge to convert. But at the same time, we think that's the largest audience. We still believe that we have a very big portion of the our research has said there's probably 12 to 15 million people in the U.S. that bet a minimum of $50 a week. Um, you know, those aren't typically whales, but those are a pretty big audience that we think we want to be able to tap into. What's the business approach for for marketing? How do you generate awareness? What's your your plan for growth? I mean, we, we spend dollars in the typical areas where a lot of customer activation and acquisition places are going to be. So it's it's Facebook, it's Google AdWords, it's Instagram. Uh, unfortunately, right now, Twitter is an interesting place. They're a large platform and there's a lot of sports bettors that are there, but they don't accept advertising from sports betting content companies, which we think is a kind of uh, weird stance to take. And we've been I won't say lobbying in sort of the governmental sense, but we've been talking to Twitter a lot about how we can convert that kind of thinking. Uh, we're not an operator. We don't take bets. We're just about information and tools. And they take um, dollars from sportsbook operators. So we think that's a curious approach and that'll change over time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the ways that consumers find our content and access our tools are through natural search. So people using Google and other tools to find what are the best odds for you know, the Super Bowl or an individual game or an individual event or a tennis match, those users through our incredible SEO tools are going to come to a piece of Action Network content on the web, hopefully download our app and become a, a user. And, you know, we really want to drive into an app experience. The most deep functionality and experience around our platform is at the Action Network app. Uh, which you can find in, in the App Store from Apple, you can find in the Google Play Store. And we think that's where the user is going to find the best experience and be able to track picks, line shop, all of those things at scale. So the content's key in, in reaching the audience. It is. It is. The, the content really is a way that we drive a lot of experience into the product. And once you've seen that content, you're able to see the value in our tools and the value in our experience. And hopefully you're a retained user and hopefully you become a subscriber. You know, we, 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 have a big part of our business is driven through subscription, but we also want to have a lot of content in front of the wall so that a user is not intimidated and hopefully will download the app and have a good experience. But we, we really want to balance what is trying to grow and build the largest audience possible while also building a subscription platform and then also building an affiliate platform. So those three sometimes mm -hmm. things can oppose each other and we're trying to figure out the best ways that they don't. But with more and more states coming, we know these audiences are going to double and triple and quadruple over the next two, three, four years. What states do you think are next? We think Colorado is 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 approved for mobile. And when that's functional and operational, will soon to be seen. Uh, Virginia is going to be very soon. Michigan is already approved. It'll take some time. We might not see fully mobile betting until after the football season and the early start of 2021. But we're most excited about Colorado, Virginia, and uh, Tennessee. Tennessee is, is, is a state where you don't really have any uh, horse, base, horse betting. You really There's really not a betting uh, uh, legal option in that state, and that's been approved. So going into that market, we think it'll be a big one. That's a, a hotbed for college football, NASCAR, and other big opportunities. You mentioned earlier March Madness is a, is a big time for you guys, mm -hmm. if not probably the biggest time for you guys. What other sports do you cover? We cover virtually everything you could think of. We cover all the big bat and ball sports. I mean, our biggest categories are going to be baseball, NCAA football, NFL, NBA, college basketball, but we're seeing massive growth in other categories, EPL, Champions League, hockey, um, and golf. We're, golf has been an interesting one. Golf in many ways is, is a challenger league and maybe not has the largest audience if you look at sort of the other sports, but it's been our fastest growing. If you look at the number of pickers, people that are actually making picks and the number of picks, it's grown faster than any sport in our platform over 300% year on year. So we see emergent sports happening. XFL has been another interesting one, which is a challenger leading to the NFL in a different season, but you can track your picks in our app for the XFL and 
And it's really a complement to your viewing experience. We, in many ways, want to be your your partner while you're watching in a new scoreboard. I think there's a new modern scoreboard that we are building that's very different than you're typically going to see at ESPN or CBS Sports, which is you know, runs and touchdowns and, and, and lines, et cetera. But we're going to provide game win probability and a lot of data that you can watch in real time to see if you're going to cover the pick that you've made, cover the bet that you've made in our platform. That's cool. It's kind of a, a more making the these professional sports more interactive in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's part of what we want to do. We want to, and, and this is where there's vested interest in what happens in the last three minutes of a Tennessee Titans, Arizona Cardinals game, which might not have any, uh, relevance for the playoffs, uh, the, uh, the you know might not, might not mean anything. Granted, the Titans had a good year this year, maybe not the best example, but that is a scenario where if it's the fourth quarter and the game is not tight and it feels irrelevant, who cares about that game? Fantasy players and sports betters, and those are massive markets, both of them. And I think the leagues and the media companies are a little bit scared of promoting that too much, but we think that's going to change and we think that'll change a lot. I mean, the XFL is 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 a new and an upstart, but they have spreads, they have lines, they have over-unders that are right on the screen that are part of that experience. And and I think it's often not authentic when certain media coverage doesn't really include what we all think is rather obvious, which is betters have a vested interest in every single game. And I'm not saying you need to beat the consumer over the head, but it would be useful to have some part of that experience driven towards the, the individual who's consuming that content based on the outcome they have through a wager. What do you think of the XFL? Do you think it'll succeed? I, I think the XFL has obviously much deeper pockets than the the AAF, which tried to also be a challenger league to the NFL. I don't think, not even don't think, there hasn't been a successful competitor to the NFL really ever. XFL tried once, AF tried once too. Um, we believe in the XFL. They're a partner of ours. We cover it. People really care about it from a betting perspective. That's where I think this is a league that's going to have legs through betting and through consumers that have a downtime around their favorite seasonality to bet, which is the NFL. So uh, we, we cover it in the same way with the same tenacity that we do the NFL. And we really hope that they stick around. Do you see sports betting evolving into other areas? I came across what a, a, a football player index. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's in, in Europe, I think. Do you see betting on individual players? Absolutely. Prop bets are a very big part of our platform. And prop bets, in many ways, are the easiest entry to sports betting for fans because it's the typical fantasy player. Yeah. The fantasy investor, the fantasy gamer, knows on an individual basis how to invest in players when they're starting and creating their lineups in, in DFS or in season-long football. And those same algorithms that inform our content for DFS and for fantasy, because we have tools that inform those consumers as well, inform our prop betting tools. So prop betting and in-game betting is a big part in Europe, and we know it's going to come here and be more important. But a lot of consumers, they just know the players they love or the players they don't, and they want to be able to bet in that way. So we have tons of tools and data and proprietary analysis around prop betting, and that's only going to grow. What about esports? Do you see esports come in in the sports betting realm? We do. Esports is a tricky one. There's definitely a large base of consumers, and the reality is that a lot of them are under the age of 21, and you need to be 21 to bet. Certainly people are circumventing that, but I think that's one challenge. The consumer, it's growing, and it's massive, and there's a lot of young fans that aren't fans of teams or fans of their parents' teams or their friends' teams. Instead, they're fans of esports. So we're, we're keeping a, a, an eye on it. We do cover esports and we create content. We have investors that are investors in esports, so we know the importance of it. But another concern around esports, and we'll see how this evolves over time, is integrity. Where can you really see that the, is there's integrity for you to be able, be able to bet on? So that's been an issue in other sports. I think it's one that esports has to get through, and that's going to happen through time and through another issue and another challenge is that a lot of legal books are not creating odds for esports. So to bet on anything, you need odds. So I think that combination of factors is the, is is an issue: the demographics of the category, the integrity, and the ability to create odds to bet against. Going forward uh, into this next year and, and future years, what's what are you guys working on? What's new for Action Network? Many, many things we're working on that are that are increasingly important as the business evolves and matures. And those include more partnerships with leagues and right holders. Our golf bet partnership with the PGA Tour is one we're very proud of. And we can see other leagues being being able to create similar partnerships there. 
continuing to evolve the product experience. We want our products to be more engaging and fun. We think they are today, but is there a sort of a gamification opportunity inside of our app that we think about and want to invest in? We, from a commercial perspective, we want to continue to build partnerships with sportsbook operators and be what we think is the most fertile and best place for affiliate conversion for them. And we've proven that out just in the first two months of this year. We're hoping to grow that. But I think for us, it's continuing to grow our, the commercial side of our business through the affiliate channel, continuing to build the best tools and the best products for consumers and and having a a, a subscription opportunity that users are going to love and, and want to engage in. And then we've talked about it before, but how can we do all these things in concert with finding more casual fans or even not casual fans, because I think in many ways it's a misnomer. I think if you're a fan of sports, you're a true fan of sports. And I don't think they're the casual fan might just watch the Super Bowl. But if you're a fan that's watching 15 NBA games a year, and if you're watching NFL football every Sunday, some people might try to claim that's a casual fan. I would say unequivocally it's not. And we can appeal to that consumer with tools and data and modestly priced subscription plat products that – Again, as more of these states come online, if you're a, you know, a, a, a person in ten, Tennessee that was going to wait till it was available, you're now going to have that chance. We've done some proprietary research that's determined that 79% of fantasy players would bet on sports if it was legal in their state. So that's that, I think, is going to be the kind of momentum that's going to happen in all the states that we think are going to become legal in 2020 and 2021. Now, personally, do you have a favorite sport? I've I've favorite sport to watch uh, is NFL football. Still, I think it's the best product there is. Uh, I think it's 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 just too compelling, and I'm a huge Eagles fan. But uh, I'm a big golf fan. I'm a big golf better, and I'm a, I'm a big a big golf player. Uh, so that those are that those are probably my two favorites. But you know, I'll, I'll I'll watch any sport and and listen to any podcast on sports or sports betting or technology or virtually anything, but those are kind of where my fandom lies. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Penn National Gaming recently? They teamed up with uh, Barstool mm -hmm. um, and maybe what that means for the for the industry. We think it's great for the industry. I mean, to see an exit for a sports content data or for a sports content company like they are, a digital sports content company, they they certainly made a pivot towards sports betting, which I think was smart of that business. And they have a massive audience that can convert customers at scale for a business like Penn National, which is a smart operator that doesn't have a brand that's recognizable to anyone. So to be able to to lock arms with a brand like Barstool, uh, I think was a very smart move. And it, again, it, I think it portends the opportunity for anyone who's an investor who's trying to acquire customers. And I think it makes a ton of sense. And for us, it's a big opportunity because Barstool is going to be the exclusive commercial partner of Penn National. And Barstool has always been a place where lots of other sports books have been investors from a a customer acquisition standpoint, really as an advertiser. And we hope to be able to sort of be the place that a lot of those sports books and advertisers that have non-commercial exclusivity to Penn National be able to come to. Excellent. Long-term trends I'd like to ask you about. It could be about the sports betting industry, mm -hmm. your business, or, or, I mean, you're an investor as well. What one trend do you see playing out over the next year or several years? I don't even know if it's a trend, but it's something that is just a, a affirmed reality is just the importance of mobile. So we all have computers in our pockets. It's a global phenomenon that will only increase and grow. And to be able to do the kinds of things that you can do on a mobile device, I think are only going to increase. They've, they've, they've increased our ability to be more healthy, to be more connected to other people internationally. I mean, there are certainly the issues around addiction to mobile and things like that. And I see my kids every day and I wish they spent less time on them sometimes. But to be able to do the kinds of things that you can do on mobile platforms, I think are critical. It's critical to the growth of, growth of our business. It'll be critical to the growth of the entire sports betting industry. And I'm just really excited to see what can happen with wearables, with mobile devices, and with a deeper uh, deeper and more personal technologies around mobile, I think are really going to be exciting for the next several years. Have you invested personally in those themes? I have, not successfully. Um, uh, from a private standpoint, uh, hopefully from a, pri from a public standpoint, I've invested successfully. I mean, I, I think it's hard to deny the power of the, of the FANG companies, and you can add Microsoft to that. I, I think the growth of, of SaaS as a category, I mean, software as a service is something we think a lot about in our business. Are there opportunities for us to 
weaponize the affiliate opportunity for other channels and create new marketplaces to try and acquire customers. I think that SaaS has just really proven its ability to, to, to drive engagement, to have highly repeatable revenue. That's part of why our subscription business often feels like a SaaS business, but super serving consumers with great software and great mobile software. I think there's just infinite opportunity to continue there. All right. Now this is our, uh, our speed round. Okay. Uh, trend or fad. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to mention a concept and you can mention whether it's a trend or fad and you can explain your answer or not. Okay. Virtual reality, trend or fad? I'm going to go in between, but probably a little bit more fad. I mean, I saw a lot of businesses in the early 2000s, mid 2000s that tried to create these environments. And I don't know if I would call what my kid, my kids play a ton of Roblox. They play a ton of, of, of different games that I wouldn't call virtual reality. I mean, they're a way for you to sort of have a different version of yourself and have fun, but um, maybe a little bit more fad for me than, than reality. I think it's, it's just, it's, it's antisocial. It's not inclusive. I just don't think the, those are the experiences that consumers are going to care for over time. This is probably a layup, but cord cutting, trend or fad? Absolute trend, absolute reality, inevitability. Uh, I don't think there's any case that we're going to see that trend reverse. You've talked a little bit in the past, I think, of, about modern media. Mm-hmm. What, what does that mean to you, modern media? Uh, modern media to me is mobile first. Um, it's 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 digital, it's mobile, it's personable, it's addressable, and it allows the consumer to have choice and dr- have choice and drive the personal outcomes that they want. I mean, I look at my personal experience. There, there is not a live terrestrial television experience I will ever include in, consume that's not sports or news um, ever unequivocally. I mean, I watch. I'll be the first to admit I watch The Bachelor with my daughter, and we usually watch it on Tuesday because we don't want to see the ads on Monday, and she's got to go to bed. Like I think that phenomenon is an absolute reality that's only going to increase. And we've seen I, I've cut the cord in my home. Uh, I'm you know not a kid, but there, there's there's a massive net new customer that will never understand, know, or consume what cable ever was, right? Or even broadcast for a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Cryptocurrency trend or fad? trend. Massively important. I mean, as a store of value, I think it's a a critical uh, sort of parallel opportunity for finance, economy, et cetera. There are some who say you should have 1% of your net worth in crypto. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Uh, I dabble in crypto and invest in crypto. I believe in it as a, as a store of value that's parallel to a lot of the other store of values and uh, will continue to. I've, I'm an investor in a number of uh, venture capital funds, including Union Square Ventures and others, and they have very thoughtful opinions and bias uh, in favor of these. And I believe in them, and they've been great investors. And I, I absolutely believe in crypto and the future of crypto. Are you holding multiple digital currencies, or is it Bitcoin primarily? Or? Bitcoin, Ethereum, those those are kind of typical ones. Uh, Bitcoin Cash. Um, I, I absolutely believe in them. I'm a huge. I'm, I know it's not crypto, but the convenience to be able to to distribute and to pay through Venmo, PayPal. I mean, that's the absolute future, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Coordinated team touchdown dances, trend or fad? Trend. I mean, I think that's some of the most fun. I mean, people say the NFL is the no fun league, and to sort of end some of those restrictions around celebration and the coordinated efforts around celebration, super fun. I hope it continues. They've worked that hard. Might as well let them dance. Absolutely. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us on um, Trends with Benefits. How can people find you? They can find me on Twitter, where I'm PH Keen, at PH Keen. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter and love it as a platform to communicate this, what we're doing at Action Network and continue to do. We can be found at actionnetwork.com or download our app through the Apple uh, App Store or through Google Play. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Trends with Benefits. <laughs>